So today's Grand Rounds will be in updates in inpatient medicine. My name is Elin Zhang. I have the pleasure of helping to organize your Grand Rounds every month. And this month, I'll be giving the Grand Rounds. I'm one of the internal medicine trained inpatient faculty for the Valley Family Medicine Residency. My goals for you guys today. Um, so one of my personal goals is to provide evidence-based clinical care. And so I like to review notable literature um, over the past year and talk about how it impacts my own personal clinical practice. This started as a series that I gave when I was on faculty at the UW and I thought I'd share it with the Valley uh, uh, clinical faculty here. I would love to hear about any feedback um, about how applicable it is to your practice. And so what I've done is I've reviewed primary literature in major medical journals for the past year from December 2019 to December 2020. I specifically chose articles that impact patient, inpatient care and excluded any COVID literature because that in itself would fill a talk. And then I try to identify any major themes and, um, within the literature as well as any specific papers that inform practice. Now, my big disclosure is that I'm not a subspecialist. I'll be reviewing a lot of subspecialty literature um, through the lens of a generalist, but I did talk to several subspecialists to get their input as well. My objectives for you guys, by the end of this talk, you'll be able to identify when beta-lactams may be used as oral step-down therapy. We'll be able to assess the risk of aortic aneurysm and dissections in, uh, with fluoroquinolones. Distinguish between contrast-associated and contrast-induced AKI. Manage patients with AFib, in particular new onset AFib and those with con concomitant end-stage renal disease and determine the importance of early endoscopy and upper GI bleed. And if we have time, we'll talk about uh, recognizing the prevalence of DKA as a side effect of SGLV2 inhibitors. So let's go ahead and get started. If you guys have any questions or any comments during the, um, during the, the chat or during the talk, excuse me, I welcome you guys to use the question and answer section as well as using the chat. So our first section is gonna be updates in infectious disease. Two major themes came out of the infectious disease literature this year, um, talking about oral, uh, oral step-down therapy using beta-lactams, as well as assessing the risk of aortic aneurysm and dissections with fluoroquinolones. Let's start out with the case. You're taking care of Mr. A. He's a 76-year-old man with a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, who presents with sepsis from pyelonephritis. His blood and urine cultures grow E. coli that's resistant to fluoroquinolones and bathroom, but sensitive to cephalosporins. In the hospital, he clinically improves on IV ceftriaxone, and on hospital day three, he would like to discharge home. So can he be transitioned to oral antibiotics? So let me ask you guys, can his E. coli bacteremia be treated with oral antibiotics? Is it A, no, GNR bacteremia should never be treated with IV antibiotics? No, his E. coli is resistant to highly bioavailable oral antibiotics that you might consider? Or yes, you can switch to an oral cephalosporin. What do you guys think? Great, we have, some, we have a few responses in already. And it looks like the vast majority of you guys chose, yes, he can switch to an oral cephalosporin. And I would agree. So let's review the literature on this. So overall, over the past few years, there's been a trend toward using oral step-down therapy for various infections that have historically been treated with IV antibiotics. For example, the POET trial came out looking at oral antibiotics and endocarditis, the Oviva trial in bone and joint infections, and then some other trials looking at oral antibiotics in GNR bacteria. 
However, these studies relied on highly bioavailable oral antibiotics such as fluoroquinolones and Bactrim. But over time, what we notice is that there's increasing bacterial resistance to these, organ, uh, to these antibiotics. And with fluoroquinolones in particular, there's been some concerns for adverse rodents that we'll talk about later. Beta-lactams as a whole have much lower bioavailability. And currently there's no clear guideline recommendations on whether oral antibiotics can be used for GNR bacteremia. So this study that came out in JAMA, uh, which was a retrospective cohort study, sought to compare beta-lactams with highly bioavailable antibiotics such as fluoroquinolones and Bactrim for GNR bacteremia from a urinary source. They looked at 4,000 adults hospitalized with positive urine and blood cultures for E. coli, Klebsiella, and Proteus who had been on one to five days of IV antibiotics and excluded anybody who might have required longer duration of antibiotics, such as those with polymicrobial bloodstream infections, abscess, or prostatitis. They separated th this group into two cohorts, those who had received fluoroquinolones and Bactrim and those who had received a beta-lactam. We talked about the overall structure of the study. So let's talk about the demographics. Um, so on average, patients in the study were older with a mean age of 71. It was overwhelmingly men. About 17% of patients were initially admitted to the ICU, but otherwise they had relatively similar comorbidities and severity of disease. In terms of the antibiotics used, um, patients in the fluoroquinolone and Bactrim group, actually 78% of those received ciprofloxacin. Within the beta-lactam group, about 25% of patients received cefpodoxime, cefalexin, and augmentin, respectively. Patients on average received four to five days of IV antibiotics before being transitioned to oral antibiotics, and both groups received about 14 days of antibiotics total. Now, looking at the outcomes at 30 days, for the primary outcome, which was a composite of mortality and recurrent bacteremia, they found that there was no significant difference between the two groups, nor was there any significant difference when they looked at the individual components of the primary outcome. So no difference in mortality or recurrent bacteremia. And when they looked out to 90 days, they found similar results for recurrent bacteremia. So from this, the authors concluded that an uncomplicated enterobacterialis bacteremia from a urinary source, oral step-down therapy with beta-lactams was not associated with increased mortality or recurrent bacteremia. Now, this is the largest cohort to date that I've been able to find, um, though it is still a retrospective study and has limited generalizability since they only included older men and over 70% of the bugs were E. coli. And there was a relatively late transition to oral antibiotics um, and a long treatment duration. So going back to Mr. A, presenting with E. coli pyelonephritis and bacteremia resistant to fluoroquinolones and Bactrim, can he be transitioned to oral beta-lactams? The vast majority of you guys said yes, and I would agree. The, tea take, the key takeaway from this study is that oral beta-lactams may be reasonable as step-down therapy in select patients with uncomplicated gram-negative bacteremia from a urinary source. Some expert thoughts from our ID colleagues. You can likely switch before day four as soon as they're hemodynamically stable in a febrile. However, a lot of gram-negative bugs are prone to multi-drug resistance or ESBLs. And so if those are the cases, you cannot trust the sensitivities and you should get ID involved. All right, let's move on to a hypothetical situation. What if Mr. A, same patient, was coming in instead with sepsis secondary to a right lower lobe pneumonia? He's empirically treated with IV ceftriaxone and gets better. His blood cultures from admission grow strep pneumo. On hospital day four, he's ready for discharge. Can he be transitioned to oral antibiotics? 
So can his strep bacteremia be tr uh, treated with oral antibiotics? What do you guys think? Yes, you can switch to an oral fluoroquinolone. No, strep bacteremia should be treated with IV antibiotics. Yes, you can switch to an or oral beta-lactam. Or no, he's got risk factors for oral fluoroquinolone oral fluoroquinolone use and thus should receive IV antibiotics. What do you guys think? Oops, sorry. And for those who joined us late in order to participate, you guys can go to pullup.com slash elinzane921 or text elinzane921 to 22333 and then just type in your answer. So it looks like we have a few responses here and the vast majority of people said you can switch to an oral beta-lactam. And I would agree. And actually it'd be reasonable to switch to an oral fluoroquinolone as well. So let's look at the evidence behind this. Um, there was a multi-center retrospective cohort out this year that looked at about 220 patients hospitalized for strep bacteremia. And they also excluded more complicated infections, such as endocarditis, meningitis, or polymicrobial bloodstream infections. They separated these patients into those who'd received fluoroquinolones and those who'd received beta-lactams and looked at outcomes through 90 days. The primary outcome was clinical success, which was a composite of lack of all-cause mortality, lack of recurrent bloodstream infections, and lack of infection-related readmissions. On average, the patients were about 64, evenly split between males and females. Similar to the prior study, patients received several days of IV antibiotics, about five to six days before being transitioned to oral antibiotics, and received a total of 14 days of antibiotics. Strep pneumo was the most common organism in the study, followed by strep pyogenes. In terms of the outcome, the primary outcome of clinical success did not differ between the two groups and was significant for non-inferiority. There was also no difference between fluoroquinolones and the beta-lactam group when looking at the individual composites of components of clinical success. The only risk factor that seemed to increase um, the only thing that seemed to be associated with increased odds of clinical failure was stepping down to oral therapy within three days of admission. And so based on this, can he be transitioned to oral beta-lactams for his strep pneumobacteremia? The key takeaway is yes. Oral beta-lactams may be reasonable for step down, as step-down therapy for select patients with uncomplicated strep bacteremia after three days of IV antibiotics. Now, a few words of caution from my ID colleagues. So this likely does not apply to all strep species, in particular, strep viridans, that often indicates an endovascular infection. And so those patients should not be transitioned to oral antibiotics without having ID on board. And so in general, we can feel pretty good about treating strep pneumobacteremia, but otherwise we should probably at least touch base with our ID colleagues. All right, let's talk about another hypothetical situation for Mr. A. So he's now coming in with E. coli pyelonephritis and bacteremia, but this time his sensitivities show resistance to oral beta-lactams such as amoxicillin and ampicillin, cephalosporins, and Bactrim, but it is sensitive to fluoroquinolones. In the hospital, you treat him with IV zosin, and on hospital day three, he's stable and requesting to go home. How would you manage this patient? So would you place a pick to complete IV therapy as an outpatient, discharge on oral fluoroquinolones, or if you have some other thoughts, feel free to type it in the chat box. I'll be monitoring. What do you guys think?
All right. So it looks like the majority of people who've had a chance to answer think that it would be safe to discharge on oral fluoroquinolones. And in this case, I would agree. So what is the risk of aortic aneurysms and dissections of fluoroquinolones? So at the end of 2018, the FDA came out with this black box warning that in patients on fluoroquinolones, there, in certain patients, there was an increased risk of um, aortic aneurysms and dissections. And this was based on prior observational studies that had shown a twofold increase in the risk of aneurysms and dissections on, with patients on fluoroquinolones. But some notable limitations about these studies. These studies were prone to residual confounding. They oftentimes compared fluoroquinolones against patients who were not on any antibiotics or were on amoxicillin, which is a notably narrower antibiotic. So the comparator groups may have been healthier. So not a true equal comparison. And they were also prone to surveillance bias, meaning they didn't control for baseline imaging. And the hypothesis is that patients who are treated with fluoroquinolones, those infections might have predisposed them to get more abdominal imaging that might have instantly, incidentally found these aneurysms or dissections. And so two um, studies came out in JAMA of last year seeking to evaluate the association of fluoroquinolones with um, aneurysms and dissections. The first of which was an observational cohort study who sought to look at this association while accounting for those confounders that really limited prior studies. They used um, a large commercial US health insurance claims database, excluded patients who were really young, who are not truly at risk for aneurysm or dissection, patients who already had a history of aneurysms or dissections or those who had been recently hospitalized. And then they separated these, this into two cohorts, a pneumonia cohort and a UTI cohort. And the idea here was by separating them out by antibiotic indication, they would be accounting for any residual confounding. The pneumonia cohort they then looked at patients who had been treated with fluoroquinolones versus those who had been treated with azithromycin. In the UTI cohort, they looked at those, uh, they looked at a comparison of fluoroquinolones versus Bactrim and performed one-to-one -one matching based on demographics, comorbidities, and medications that they might have been on. And they followed these patients through 60 days with the primary outcome of hospitalization for aortic aneurysm or dissection. So looking with, um, at the results, in the pneumonia cohort, they were on average 63, pretty evenly split between men and women. And here they did find that fluoroquinolones was associated with a significantly increased risk of aortic aneurysm and dissections. The absolute risk was small, um, but this was a significant increase. However, notably, they were unable to control for baseline imaging in this cohort. In the UTI cohort, patients were on average the same age, but were overwhelmingly female. And here they did not find any significant increase with fluoroquinolone use, um, but they were able to control for baseline imaging in this study, or in this cohort, excuse me. So from this, the authors concluded that fluoroquinolone use may be associated with an increase, with a small increase in um, aortic aneurysm or dissection but the absolute risk was small. Now, they did a secondary analysis where they went back to that insurance claims database, excluded the same patients, but this time separated patients into those who'd received fluoroquinolones and amoxicillin, regardless of what the antibiotic indication was. This was essentially replicating one of the prior uh, observational studies that had been done. They performed one-to-one -one matching, just like before. And after one-to-one -one matching, they found that the fluoroquinolone use still had increased rates of baseline imaging compared to the amoxicillin group. When they didn't control for baseline imaging, they found that fluoroquinolones were associated with a significantly higher risk of aneurysms and dissections. But when they did control for baseline imaging, therefore accounting for surveillance bias, 
that risk was attenuated to the point that it was no longer significant. So from this, the authors concluded that fluoroquinolones, at least compared to moxicillin, did not appear to increase the risk of aortic aneurysms or dissections when controlled for baseline imaging. Now, the second study that came out in the same, uh, in JAMA, was a nested case control study. This time they used a large Taiwanese health insurance database and split patients up based on those who had a new diagnosis of aneurysm and dissection versus those who had not. And from the point of new diagnosis, they looked back 60 days to see if there were any infections and what antibiotics were used during that time. From that group, they found 10 matched controls based on demographics, the types of infections, and also notably any aneurysm or dissection risk factors. They had two primary objectives. The first was to estimate the risk of aortic aneurysm and dissections associated with infections alone. The authors postulated that having an infection would increase your risk. And so maybe that rather than the antibiotic use was actually what was increasing the risk um, of aneurysms and dissections. And what they found was that patients with any infection had a two to four fold increased odds of aneurysm or dissection with the highest being intra-abdominal infections. Next, their second objective was to assess the comparative risk of aneurysm and dissections with fluoroquinolones versus other antibiotics. So they took their matched cohort and excluded anybody who was on more than one antibiotic and then separated these patients into those who were on fluoroquinolones only, on amoxicillin, clavulanate, or unison, so both the PO and IV form, and those who were on any form of cephalosporins. Then when they did a comparative analysis here, they found that compared to fluoroquinolones, augmentin and cephalosporins did not increase, were not associated with an increased or decreased risk of aneurysms and dissections. And so they concluded that fluoroquinolones compared to other antibiotics were not at, uh, patients on fluoroquinolones were not at increased risk. So what can we conclude from these two studies? Fluoroquinolone use may be associated with a small, absolute increased risk of aortic aneurysms or dissections, but the uh, overall absolute risk was low, less than 0.1%. Infections alone may be associated with an increased risk of aneurysms and dissections. And compared to other antibiotics, fluoroquinolone use did not seem to increase the risk. The first study that we looked at, some major limitations were that the patients were relatively young. So maybe they weren't actually capturing the group that was at highest risk. And they also did not control for specific risk factors for aneurysms and dissections. So might have been an overall healthier group. That second study was done in Taiwan, so it's limited generalizability to the US population. And when they were comparing antibiotics, there was pretty limited samples. You could see some of the sample sizes were in the hundreds. And so that limits our ability to make any conclusions um, about this third conclusion here. So going back to our patient, would you feel comfortable treating his E. coli pyelonephritis and bacteremia with oral fluoroquinolones? And I would say yes. Fluoroquinolones potentially confer a small absolute risk of aneurysms and dissections, but when appropriate, the benefit of fluoroquinolone therapy likely outweighs the small potential increased risk. Some things for us to remember as internists Fluoroquinolones still have many other side effects um, that may be a contraindication. And in patients with known aortic aneurysm and dissection risk factors, it's still worthwhile to have a risk benefit discussion. And this doesn't apply to people who have pre existing aneurysms or dissections. So, that was a lot of information. Let's synthesize some of the take-home points from infectious disease before we move on. So beta-lactams can be used for oral step-down therapy in some patients with uncomplicated GNR and strep bacteremia, except for those with ESBL 
for a multi-drug resistance, group A strep or strep viridans. And when indicated, um, the benefit of fluoroquinolone therapy likely outweighs the small potential risk of um, potential risk of aneurysms and dissections in most patients. Any questions before we move on? All right. So next we're gonna move on to updates in nephrology. And the two big themes here, we're talking about contrast associated AKI and then anticoagulation in patients with AFib and uh, concurrent end stage renal disease. So let's talk about Mr. B. He's an 83 year old man with a history of hypertension, CAD, CKD3, who presents with subjective fevers, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. His initial labs are notable for a white count of 13, creatinine of 2.9, up from a baseline of 1.7. And you'd like to obtain a CT scan to rule out an intra-abdominal infection. What is the risk of AKI with IV contrast in this patient? So do you think there's no risk? Go ahead and pursue CT with IV contrast. A potential but minimal risk prehydrate and then pursue a CT scan with IV contrast, or he's at risk, so you should pursue a non-contrast CT. What do you guys think? And so for those of you who joined later, again, you can participate by logging onto this site or texting ELNZ 92122 to 22333. All right, so it looks like most of you guys think that there's a potential but minimal risk. It's okay to proceed with CT with IV contrast. And I would agree. So let's look at what came out this past year to support that. So let's review the history of iodinated contrast with kidney injury. Previously, contrast was hyperosmolar, which would lead to renal tubular injury and vasoconstriction, as well as a lot of fluid shifts, all of which lead to a decrease in your GFR. But now we use isoosmolar contrast, and the risk of renal injury is thought to be much lower. So the American College of Radiology, as well as the National Kidney Foundation came out with a consensus statement on the use of IV contrast in CKD. They specifically differentiate between contrast associated AKI from contrast induced AKI. Contrast associated AKI is coincidence AKI that occurs within 48 hours of receiving IV contrast. This kind of acknowledges that patients who need IV contrast have many other factors for AKI that might be causing their AKI. Contrast-induced AKI implies causality between contrast, uh, receiving the contrast and AKI that usually also occurs within 48 hours. And so, they reviewed a number of observation studies to look at the relative risk of both of these. And what you'll find is that contrast associated AKI does indeed increase as your GFR decreases. The contrast induced AKI, so the injury that's actually associated or attributable to contrast is negligible until your GFR is less than 30. And even in this category, there was a wide range of reported incidences between zero to 17%. And it was largely based on observational studies. And so what this consensus statement recommended was that in patients with GFR of 30 to 44, you should prehydrate with normal saline if they're at high risk. And with those with a GFR of less than 30, you should discuss the risks and benefits with radiology prehydrate with normal saline um, if contrast is needed, but in general, if it's really critical, it's probably okay to proceed. And so coming back to our patient who needs a CT scan, what's the risk of AKI with IV contrast? I agree with the majority of you that there is a potential but pretty minimal risk in this patient with a GFR of 37. And so, because his GFR is greater than 30, 
Receipt of IV contrast is unlikely to be associated with any significant renal injury. And even if his GFR was lower, if it's really critical for patient care, a contrast study should likely should be performed regardless. Now let's say you do some additional workup. You get your CT scan. What you actually find is that instead of an intra-abdominal section, he actually has new ascites from new onset heart failure. His hospital stay is complicated by progressive AKI and volume overload and is initiated on hemodialysis. On hospital day four, he develops new onset AFib. His TTE shows no valvular dysfunction and his CHADS VAS score is five and has no history of major bleeding events. How would you manage his new onset AFib? And so my question to you guys is, in patients with AFib on dialysis, what would you use to decrease his stroke risk? Warfarin, apixaban, rivaroxaban, dabigatran, or no anticoagulation at all? Let's see what you guys have said. So it looks like we're pretty split between warfarin and apixaban. We have some votes for no anticoagulation. And so let's review the literature here. All three of these are acceptable. And so atrial fibrillation is all about managing thromboembolic risk with bleeding risk. And unfortunately, with patients on end -stage with end-stage renal disease, um, both risks are increased. In 2011, the KDIGO guidelines and the 2012 Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines actually do not recommend routine anticoagulation for primary prevention of stroke in patients with AFib and end-stage renal disease. This was largely based on prior studies and further bolstered by this new study that came out in 2017 that shown that when warfarin is compared to patients who don't get anticoagulation, there's actually no difference in the incidence of ischemic stroke, which is the main thing we're trying to prevent. Um, in this study, there was also no difference in all-cause mortality or bleeding. However, the 2019 ACC um, AHA AFib guidelines state that it might be reasonable to consider apixaban or warfarin for anticoagulation of these patients. And this was largely influenced by a large study that came out in 2018 that looked at over 25,000 patients with AFib on, um, and concurrently on hemodialysis, which showed that apixaban and warfarin were equivalent when it came to preventing stroke and systemic embolism, but that apixaban was actually associated with a lower bleeding risk. This past year, a big network meta-analysis sought to evaluate the safety and efficacy of direct oral anticoagulants and warfarin compared to no anticoagulation for patients on AFib, uh, with pa for patients with AFib on long-term dialysis. So a network meta-analysis um, compares studies that don't have the same study groups and allows you to make indirect associations. And so each of these lines and the thickness of these lines represents the number of studies that compared these two, these two groups. So one study looked at five milligrams of apixaban versus 2.5 milligrams, but the vast majority of studies actually compared no anticoagulation um, to warfarin. They looked at three major outcomes, stroke and or systemic embolism, all-cause mortality, and then major bleeding. And for the major bleeding outcomes, they, were, they did find several other papers that looked at other DOACs besides apixaban. So what did they find in their results? Well, for the outcome of stroke is systemic embolism, they found that apixaban at either dose in warfarin were no different than patients who were not on any anticoagulation. 
though this was limited by significant heterogeneity. With regards to all-cause mortality, interestingly, they found that patients who were on a pixaban 5 milligrams actually had lower all-cause mortality than those who were on no anticoagulation, a pixaban 2.5, or warfarin, but again, limited by significant heterogeneity. They didn't have enough information from the studies to postulate why this might be the case. And then lastly, uh, with regards to major safety outcome of major bleeding, they found that apixaban was equivalent to no anticoagulation. Apixaban and no anticoagulation was associated with lower bleeding compared to all other anticoagulants. And that between warfarin and dabigatran, warfarin was associated with lower risk of bleeding. And so from this, the authors concluded that oral anticoagulants were not clearly associated with a decreased risk of thromboembolism in patients with AFib on long-term dialysis. And warfarin is associated with a higher risk of bleeding than no anticoagulation or apixaban. This was a really large meta-analysis, which was the strength of this paper, um, but there was high heterogeneity and there was pretty limited data on DOAX really only two papers. All the other papers compared warfarin with no anticoagulation. Um, and it doesn't really help us figure out any, uh, it doesn't help us account for any differences that might be um, attributed to patients who are preferentially prescribed DOAX versus warfarin. And so overall, for our patient who's on hemodialysis and non-valvular AFib um, with RVR, would you anticoagulate this patient for primary stroke prevention? And so the key takeaway here is that anticoagulation might not actually decrease the risk of thromboembolism um, in this patient population, but more studies are needed. And overall, there's a trend in the literature that a pixaban five milligrams twice daily might be a safe and effective alternative dose, uh, alternative to warfarin in patients who do warrant anticoagulation. All right, so let's, uh, let's summarize some of the take home points in nephrology. The risk of renal injury that's directly a result from IV contrast, so contrast induced AKI is negligible in patients with a GFR greater than 30. And in patients with AFib and concurrent end-stage renal disease, the role of anticoagulation for primary stroke prevention remains controversial. But apixaban may be a safe alternative to warfarin in patients who warrant anticoagulation. Okay, so we have about 18 minutes left and I'll try to get through as many of these studies as possible. Um, I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions at the end, if there are any. So lastly, we'll talk about updates in cardiology, GI, and endocrine. Within cardiology, the biggest paradigm shift came out about rate versus rhythm control in atrial fibrillation. And so let's go back to Mr. B. So remember, he has new onset non-valvular ACID with RVR. His heart rates are now in the 120s, but he's largely asymptomatic how would you manage his new onset AFib? Last we were talking about anticoagulation and primary stroke prevention. Here I wanna talk about rate versus rhythm control. Which do you think is more appropriate for him? I'll give you guys a few moments to answer. All right, so we have a few answers and you guys can still keep thinking about your answers as we move on. Um, but the vast majority of people have, um, have chosen rate control. And so, I think both are reasonable, but let's review some new data that kind of call into the question rate versus rhythm control strategies. So 
Current guidelines recommend weight control strategy for AFib, except in the setting of AFib-related symptoms. And this was largely based on um, the AFFIRM trial, which came out in 2002, that compared weight versus rhythm control and found that there was no difference in mortality or ischemic stroke at five years. That study did show that patients with rhythm control were more likely to be in sinus rhythm at five years. And when they did a post hoc analysis of that study, it showed that there was improved mortality associated with sinus rhythm, regardless of which group they were in. Now, most patients in the AFFIRM trial were on sodalol or amiodarone in the rhythm group, which are poorly tolerated antiarrhythmics and associated with multiple um, medication side effects. Since then, we've had some new antiarrhythmics that are better tolerated. And also we've gotten better at rhythm control strategies such as catheter ablation. The Cabana trial was a big trial in 2019 that compared antiarrhythmics against ablation and found that ablation was associated with decreased recurrent AFib and cardiovascular outcomes. And so we've revisited the question of rate or rhythm control in AFib. This was the East AFNET trial, which came out at the end of uh, 2020 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a parallel group, open, blinded to outcome, randomized control trial that sought to evaluate rate versus rhythm control in new onset AFib or early AFib in patients with concurrent cardiovascular risk factors. So they looked at nearly seven, uh, sorry, 3,000 patients, um, adults with newly diagnosed AFib within the past year. And they had to either fall into one of these groups. They had to be older than 75 with prior TIA or CVA or have multiple other risk factors and cardiovascular conditions. So meeting two of any of these criteria. They were randomized either to usual care, so rate control, or rhythm control, which could either be with meds or catheter ablation. And on average, patients were randomized 36 days after their ACID diagnosis, so truly early onset. They had a median follow-up of 5.1 years, and the outcomes that they looked at were the composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, and hospitalization, as well as the number of nights in the hospital. On average, the mean age was about 70 years old, pretty evenly split between men and women, and the average CHADS VAS score was about 3.3. The only difference between the two groups was that the usual care group, so the rate control group, expectedly had patient, more patients on rate controlling agents, such as beta blockers and digoxin. In terms of the type of AFib, um, they were pretty evenly split between persistent AFib, the first episode of AFib, and paroxysmal AFib. Um, interestingly, about 50% of patients were in sinus at the time of enrollment, and about 30% were asymptomatic. And so let's look at what interventions each group got within the first year. So 90% of patients in the usual care group, so in the rhythm, con sorry, rate control group, didn't get any rhythm control, as you would expect. In the rhythm control group, about 8% of patients received catheter ablation, and the most common antiarrhythmics that were used were flecainide, amiodarone, and dronetarone. With regards to the composite, the primary outcome, the composite of death, stroke, and cardiovascular hospitalization, they found a significantly um, lower risk of this composite outcome in the early rhythm control group. This was so compelling, in fact, that they actually terminated the study early. When looking at some of the other outcomes, looking at the nights in the hospital, there was no difference between the two groups. So those who had received rhythm control um, were not uh, more likely to be in the hospital. Those in the rhythm control group were more likely to be in sinus rhythm at two years. And when looking at a composite of safety outcomes, so stroke, death, adverse events, th there was no significant difference between the two groups. However, if you look, if you break this down, the rhythm control group was associated with a significant lower risk of stroke, 
one of these safety outcomes. But there was a significantly increased risk of some medication-associated adverse events. So overall, the conclusion from this study was that early initiation from rhythm control therapy may reduce cardiovascular events compared to rate control without affecting nights in, in the hospital. This was a large multi-center randomized control trial, um, but some of the limitations were that there were pretty low event rates, lower than what they expected. And it is not generalizable to patients with chronic AFib. So this is really about new onset early AFib. Most patients were minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic, which you might actually consider um, a potential strength because this is more, this is actually the patient population that we're more likely to treat with weight control based on the current guideline recommendations. And a good proportion of patients were lost to follow up without a clear explanation. So how would you manage his new onset AFib? A lot of you guys chose rate control and I would challenge you guys to think about early rhythm control, uh, control strategies in our patients with early AFib with other cardiovascular risk factors because it may improve cardiovascular outcomes. And so talking with some of our EP specialists, they concur that this likely um, will represent a paradigm shift in, our, in how we treat AFib we can consider an earlier cardiology consult or referral. All right, we have about 10 minutes left. I think we'll do updates in gastroenterology and probably conclude there, unless people wanna stay a little bit after time. And here, the main themes for this year are the timing of upper endoscopy and GI bleeds. So, you're taking care of Mrs. C. She's a 49-year-old woman with a history of type 2 diabetes, heart failure to reduce ejection fraction of 40%, who presents with syncope and melanoma. She's been taking ibuprofen following a recent mechanical injury. In the ED, her vitals are as reported. Her hemoglobin dropped from a baseline of 10 to 8, and her glasgow Blatchford score indicates she's at high risk of death or further bleeding. You look at the time and it's 1.45 a.m. In addition to standard management of upper GI bleed, how urgently would you consult GI? Would you consult her, consult GI now because she needs an EGD within six hours? First thing in the morning, she needs an EGD within 24 hours or non-urgently just focus on medical stabilization for now. What do you guys think? So it seems like at least for the people who've answered so far, we think that an early EGD, so an EGD within 24 hours, would be fine. Let's talk about the timing of endoscopy and upper GI bleed. So upper GI bleeds are associated with pretty high mortality, about 10% overall. And the International Consensus Group in 2019 recommended endoscopy within 24 hours of presentation. However, it's unclear what to do for patients who are at high risk of bleeding or death and whether the rule of, in, of urgent endoscopy, so within two to 12 hours, uh, would be beneficial. A paper earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, a randomized control trial, sought to evaluate if urgent endoscopy, so within six hours, improves outcomes in upper GI bleed. They looked at 600 patients who were admitted with upper GI bleed who had a high risk of further bleeding based on this Glasgow Blatchford score. They excluded any patients who presented in shock. And patients were randomized to urgent EGD, so less than six hours, 
or to early EGD, less than 24 hours. They were followed through 30 days with the primary endpoints of death, further bleeding, and hospital length of stay. On average, the patients were about, eight, uh, about 70, predominantly men, and only 4% of patients had cirrhosis. In terms of the source of GI bleed, two thirds of patients had an ulcerative bleed, less than 10% had variceal bleeds, and the rest were in this other category. In terms of the time from presentation to EGD, and the urgent group actually took about 10 hours on average for them to get to the EGD suite. And in the early group, about 25 hours. And what they found was that patients in the urgent groups who got scoped earlier, they did identify more bleeding ulcers and this did lead to more endoscopic treatment. But this didn't translate into improvement in outcomes. So there was no significant difference in mortality, further bleeding, or hospital length of stay. One thing to point out is that the mortality rates are still really high in, in upper endoscopy. And the rates of further bleeds, sorry, not in upper endoscopy, in upper GI bleeds, the rates of further bleeding were, uh, were really high, pretty consistent with what's been reported in the literature. And so in conclusion, in patients with high risk upper GI bleed, the authors concluded that urgent endoscopy within six hours increased endoscopic treatment, but did not necessarily improve outcomes. This was a randomized controlled trial that was looking at high risk GI bleeds, which was an area that, they, uh, that we wanted to study. But this has limited generalizability because this was done in a Chinese population with relatively few comorbidities. And most notably, there were very few variceal bleeds and excluded the sickest of patients who might present in shock. They evaluated um, and they sought to evaluate six versus 24 hours, but what they actually evaluated was endoscopy within 10 versus 25 hours. So it's still unclear whether or not really early endoscopy would be beneficial in any way. And so in our 49 year old woman with a history of um, who presents with high risk upper GI bleed secondary to likely um, uh, per, uh, PUD, how urgently would you consult GI here? And I agree with consulting in the morning. In patients with non-variceal, hemodynamically stable, high-risk GI bleed, urgent EGD may not actually decrease mortality. Big caveats of the study really only likely can apply to um, patients with PUD and you cannot extrapolate to patients with cirrhosis because it just was not studied. So those patients likely still benefit from urgent endoscopy. All right. And so it's four minutes before. Let's go ahead and skip to the take home points. And then if we have time or if there's interest, I can come back and review updates in endocrinology. So the overall take home points here, oral beta-lactams may be used in select patients with strep and gram-negative rod bacteremia. There's minimal risk of contrast-seduced AKI if your GFR is greater than 30. The benefit of anticoagulation in patients with end-stage renal disease and AFib is unclear, but apixaban is emerging as an alternative to warfarin. In patients with new onset AFib, consider cardiology referral to discuss rhythm control strategies. And in a non variceal upper GI bleeds, earlier endoscopy may not improve outcomes. And the last one that didn't make it onto this list was that fluoroquinolone in patients who have an indication for uh, oral fluoroquinolones, the benefit may outweigh the small potential risk of increase uh, of increased aortic aneurysms or dissections. All right. 
Um, I just wanted to give a special thanks to all of the subspecialists um, across multiple different organizations and institutions who helped answer some of my questions. And then I will leave uh, the floor open to any questions. And so I'm gonna type my email. Oh, actually my email's here up on the screen. Um, if you guys have any questions that come up after the fact, feel free to email me. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll try to get you the answer. I would also love to hear feedback on whether or not you like these kind of talks and whether or not you uh, found this helpful for your own practice and if it's something that we should continue in the future. And so it's one minute away from um, one minute away from closing. So anybody who would like to leave is welcome to leave. I'm going to leave my email in the comments in the chat box, and then I will go back and really quickly talk about SGLT2 inhibitors. For anybody who's interested in staying, feel free to stay on. I'm gonna go over just a few slides um, about updates in endocrinology. So you're taking care of Mrs. C. Remember, she's got a history of type two diabetes. She's on metformin and dipagliflozin. She's got HEFREF with uh, EF of 40% and she's coming in with an upper GI bleed. She's made NPO and undergoes a successful EGD on hospital day two. After her EGD, she develops nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and dyspnea. Here are her labs. So what is the most likely diagnosis here? I'll let you guys take a look. So notably her bicarb's 12, her blood glucose is 129, her pH is 7.25, her UA shows ketones. So what's the most likely diagnosis? Is it starvation ketoacidosis, euglycemic DKA from SGLT2 inhibitors, alcoholic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis from severe GI bleed? Looks like we have a few votes for both starvation and euglycemic DKA from SGLT2 inhibitors. So let's talk a little bit about SGLT2 inhibitors. This is probably the hottest topic that really impacts outpatient care, um, less so impacts inpatient care. And so we didn't include any of the major studies, but I'll breeze through some of the major studies that have come out over the past few years. And so in 2017 and 2018, the CAMIS and Declaratimu trial came out looking at patients with type 2 diabetes um, with increased cardiovascular risk and found that SGLT2 inhibitors decreased cardiovascular events. In 2019, the CREDENCE trial came out looking at patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD and found that SGLT2 inhibitors decreased the risk of kidney failure and cardiovascular events. All of these studies led the American Diabetes Association to update their guidelines to say SGLT2 inhibitors are second line agents in patients with type 2 diabetes and concomitant cardiovascular disease, CKD, or obesity earlier this year. More recently, there's been a wealth of, um, of evidence that have come out looking at patients with heart failure without necessary, uh, without um, concomitant diabetes necessarily. And what they found is that in the DAPA-HF trial and more recently the EMPEROR REDUCE trial that SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure decreased cardiovascular death and outcomes. When they'd done a subgroup analysis of the, some of these studies, they found that this decrease in cardiovascular death persisted regardless of whether or not somebody had type 2 diabetes. 
which led the FDA to approve dipaglifosin for heart failure. So now it's not just a diabetes medication, it's really a heart failure medication. And even more recently, they're now studying it in other patient populations. So the DAPA CKD trial looked at patients with CKD and found that SGLT2 inhibitors decrease the risk of progression to end-stage renal disease, GFR decline, and death. And so what does all of this mean? Well, what it means for an inpatient provider is that we're likely to see increased use of SGLT2 inhibitors. And so it's really important for us to understand the side effects. There have been early case reports of DKA and interestingly, euglycemic DKA. So DKA that presents with a normal blood sugar. And the FDA actually put out a warning about this risk in 2015. And some of the larger trials that came out over the past few years um, did look at did find an increased risk of DKA in patients who are in the SGLT2 group between a two-fold to 11-fold risk increase. And so what is the true risk of DKA with SGLT2 inhibitors? There are two big papers that came out earlier this year. One was a meta-analysis, the other was a retrospective cohort. The meta-analysis looked at 39 randomized control trials with over 60,000 patients. Um, with adults with type 2 diabetes that were randomized to either placebo, no treatment, or other anti-diabetes medications versus SGLT2 inhibitors. And it included some of those big trials that we just went over. The mean follow-up time was 28 weeks, and the primary outcome was the incidence of DKA. In the retrospective cohort, they looked at 3 million patients um, adults with uh, type 2 diabetes that were newly initiating an SGLD2 or DPP4 inhibitor. They matched, they did one-to-one -one matching based on demographics, comorbidities, and medications, and did a mean follow-up of about a year and also looked at the primary outcome of the incidence of DKA. So what they found was in the meta-analysis on average, in the papers, the average age was 50 to 70, but 46 to 78% male. And they found that overall SGLT2 inhibitors were associated with that 113% increase in DKA, though the number needed to harm was approaching 1,000. And this risk was highest in patients who are older than 60 and those who had been on SGLT2 inhibitors for more than a year. In the retrospective cohort, um, similar age, similar sort of demographics, about 60% of the group had had long-standing diabetes for more than 10 years. And what they found was that the incidence of SGLT, uh, the incidence of DKA was almost three times that in the SGLT2 inhibitor group compared to the DPP4 inhibitor group. The, this risk was highest among patients who were not on insulin and they did find a class effect. Canaglifosin was the highest risk with a hazard ratio of 3.6, followed by empaglifosin, and the lowest risk was uh, dipaglifosin, which was associated about, with about a twofold risk. So in conclusion, SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with a two to three-fold increase in the risk of DKA, though the overall absolute risk is small. And patients who are older and not on insulin may be at higher risk. And so the things to the key take-home points here are to suspect DKA in patients on SGLT2 inhibitors to present with abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And remember that you should hold SGLT2 inhibitors during periods of volume depletion or prolonged fasting. This is when they're at highest risk of going into DKA. And that's it. All right, thank you everybody for um, anyone who's stuck around. Again, feel free to email me with any questions. Hope you guys all have a great day.